So um, let me now um, introduce to you Mr. Stefan Bixel. Mr. Bixel uh, is the head of the Asset Management Division of Banque Cantonale Baudois, and he is a member of the Executive Board. As, as I already mentioned, uh, Banque Cantonale Baudois is our corporate sponsor, and again, we are very honored and privileged to have their corporate sponsorship, especially for this very first event that we are offering here in Lausanne. And um, as I mentioned, it is an important milestone. The society continues to grow in membership, and we are extending our reach to this lovely part of Switzerland. So with that, I hand it over to Mr. Bixel. Thank you, Philippe. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lausanne. Um, on behalf of my bank, I'm very pleased to welcome you here. And I congratulate the CFA Society for the foresight to hold the first uh, meeting uh, of this continued education seminar uh, in Lausanne. Bon uh, Cantoal Vaudois, of course, does not only believe uh, in continued education, that's why we are very pleased to associate ourselves with uh, the CFA seminar. We also believe very much in the relative growing importance of, how should I call that, the great Lausanne area as a hub for asset management. I think uh, the turnout today proves that we have a good number of CFA alumni, active or not so active possibly, so I think uh, uh, the fact that we are holding this meeting here today will help them to reactivate and to bring them back on track if that was necessary for their continued education effort. And of course, uh, there are also, we broadened the scope of the invitees, so we have uh, people who are maybe not yet CFA alumni, but uh, active in the asset management business. As I said, uh, this area is uh, doing well, it's a growing area economically, and asset management is a reflection of it, of course. Um, for those who wouldn't know that this is an area with triple A rating, one of the few. The bank is the one with a double A rating without state guarantee, one of the very few in the world. And the economic, we have what I would call today sort of the Silicon Valley of Switzerland around and along the Lake of Geneva. So all this helps us, of course, grow the business. And uh, as an asset manager, uh, BCV and as a cantonal bank is maybe a little bit atypical. Usually one would say what well, is a cantonal bank, must be a savings and loans exercise. That's not so much the case for BCV. Of course we do that also, but in terms of asset management we still have roughly 85 billion Swiss francs which are entrusted on the bank in the asset management and securities business. So that means it's not huge, but it has a good size and which allows us to do some intelligent stuff. And there, I think it's also our idea to assume our responsibility in this area to sort of give our, of course, our people in the first instance the uh, opportunity to be exposed to speakers of the quality as we have them today. I think that's uh, very pleasing. But also invite all our friendly competitors and people in the business to, uh, to gather, to have an exchange, an intelligent exchange, and to be stimulated by hopefully interesting discussions and presentations. Now, um, I don't want to be longer. I think you didn't come the, for to hear me, but you come to hear the speakers and the panel. And with this, I wish you an interesting hour or so, and I hand it back to Philip. Thank you very much, Mr. Pixel. So, um, <clears throat> we have um, our, a very distinguished panel of speakers here. Uh, Mr. Dealey will introduce the um, the, the individual speakers. I've already mentioned that uh, Mr. Jenkins and Irvin, Mr. Uh, Irwin are members of the Board of Directors. I would also like to mention that Beat Wittmann has uh, spoken at a number of our events uh, here in Switzerland for, for um, the society, including our forecast dinner, so he's quite familiar with, with our activities and we're always honored to have him um, speak at our events. So thank you again, Beat, for joining us. And obviously, uh, Mr. Deatley, um, being a CFA charter holder, also has a connection to the in Institute, uh, so we're, we're very honored to have him as our moderator. So now let me just um, introduce formally uh, Mr. Deatley. Um, Mark Deatley is the Editor-in-Chief of Finance and Wirtschaft, which is Switzerland's premier financial newspaper. Before assuming his current position, 
in January 2012, he was deputy editor and head of the international section of the paper. Prior to that, he was the US editor of Finanz und Wirtschaft, based in New York for five years, from 2003 to 2008. Mr. Dietley holds a degree in business administration from Zurich University of Applied Sciences and a degree in journalism from New York University. And uh, as I just mentioned, we're very pleased to have him as a charter holder to moderate this event. So with that, I hand it over to you, Mark. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philippe. Thank you, Mr. Bixel. Also from my side, a very warm welcome. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here on this beautiful day. Um, last week, just a week ago, we celebrated the fifth anniversary of the downfall of Lehman Brothers. Now, you're all in the investment business. I don't have to tell you how demanding and how turbulent the times uh, the past five years have been. Um, what we have seen in those five years was central banks going to places where they never have been before. We've seen instances of central banks influencing uh, financial markets like we've never seen it before. In May, a mere mumbling of the word tapering by Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke sent a shockwave through uh, many emerging markets. So we've seen and we've felt uh, with our own money and with the clients' money that, that we're working in, uh, with how demanding and how difficult uh, investing has become. Financial repression, a low yield environment, these aren't just theoretical terms anymore, these are facts that we all have to deal with. Um, so what's the way forward? What's the way forward for the asset management industry? Where do we go from here? I'm very honored to be joined here on the podium by three distinguished gentlemen. Um, just a quick back of the envelope calculation tells me that we have a combined more than 100 years of investment expertise. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to their speeches and also afterwards the, the podium discussion. We will also open it uh, for questions from you um, uh, afterwards. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the first speaker on my very far right, uh, Mr. Robert Jenkins. He's a professor of finance at London Business School. He's uh, worked for many years uh, in the banking industry. For 16 years he was uh, uh, working with Citigroup where among other uh, positions he held uh, head of trading and sales in Dubai, in Bahrain, Switzerland and Japan. He also worked with Credit Suisse, where he, where he was the Chief Investment Officer of Credit Suisse Asset Management in Japan. He was the COO of Credit Suisse Asset Management, uh, responsible for the UK and Central and Eastern Europe. From 1997 to 2009, he was with FNC Asset Management in London, first as the CEO and then as the Chairman. Um, he was, uh, after that, the CEO of Combiner Torix Capital in London. He was the chair of the Investment Management Association in the UK and the co-chair of a group that had a look at the future of the asset management industry in the UK. He served uh, a stint uh, at the Bank of England's Interim Financial Policy Committee uh, before assuming his position with the London Business School. As Philip already mentioned, Professor Jenkins is a uh, member of the Board of Governance of the CFA Institute. Next to him is uh, Roger Irwin. He's the Global Head of Investment Content at Towers Watson. He's held that position since July 2008. From 95 to 08, he was the Global Head of Investment Practice um, at uh, Towers Watson and, uh, and, and its uh, predecessor companies. Uh, he joined Watson Wired in 89, uh, where he built the firm's investment consulting practice, where he grew a team of uh, 400 professionals worldwide. Roger Irwin is involved in the Towers Watson Thought Leadership uh, Group, and as also mentioned, he is a member of the Board of Governors of the CFA Institute. Roger Irwin is also a author, an author of numerous papers on asset allocation policy and manager selection. And last but not least, on my near right is uh, Beard Whitman. He's the CEO of TCMG Asset Management. 
He's looking back on a long career in, in the asset management industry in Switzerland. He spent more than 10 years with UBS before moving uh, to Clarendon Loy, a unit of Credit Suisse in 95, where he held the, the post of CEO, investment products, chief investment officer, and a member of the executive board. In 2007, he moved to Julius Baer, where he also was a CEO of investment products and a member of the executive board. In 2009, he founded Dyna Partners, which now is part of TCMG, one of the very few pure play asset managers, asset managers we have in Switzerland. Without further ado, I'd like to give the word to Professor Jenkins. Thank you. Great. Can you hear me? It's maybe on. Is this on? Is it on now? So, mesdames et messieurs, bonjour et soyez les bienvenus. Out of courtesy to my British colleague, I will continue in English. <laughs> Very generous of you, but. <laughs> On behalf of the Board of Governors of the CFA Institute, I would like to congratulate uh, CFA Switzerland for its tremendous efforts in organizing this event. And I would like to thank uh, BCV uh, for its kind and generous support this morning. Now, uh, gatherings of this sort uh, represent a multiple opportunity. It's an opportunity to get out of the office. It's an opportunity to network. And it's an opportunity to take a step back and put the daily challenges uh, of our busy lives uh, into a somewhat broader perspective. So with that in mind, I would like to start the discussion today with four very general observations. My first observation is that we should be very careful when using the terms normal or abnormal or extraordinary to describe market conditions. Mark referred to the current challenge with which we struggle today of the low investment return environment. Now to those who have come to the profession in the last 30 years, the current return environment is without a doubt abnormally low. But if you step back far enough, you can see that such interest rate levels are historically more normal than we might expect. And indeed, from the perspective of the long term, the last 30 years were the abnormal period. And even more dramatically, We can talk more about this in a moment. My second observation is that our financial system remains both fragile and accident prone. We are working our way through the biggest credit bubble in history. Now, bubbles are not new. They're always the same, and they're always a little bit different. They all involve heavy doses of greed, stupidity, and leverage. And what distinguishes the most recent episode from all prior bubbles is the magnitude and extent of leverage. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are not going to abolish greed, and we are not going to outlaw stupidity, but we can and must do something about excessive leverage. Globally, and most unfortunately, we have not done so. Switzerland has gone farther than anyone else, but the global financial community has not even begun to come close to what Switzerland has achieved. 
Indeed, the Basel III rules institutionalize excess leverage. Yes, the reforms do establish a limit on gearing, but that limit established will unfortunately permit the banking behemoths to fund $100 of risk with $97 of debt and only $3 of loss absorbing equity. We'll put it a different way. Banks can continue to trade in the future at 33 times leverage. I think you'll remember that the average hedge fund is geared at something less than three times. So in other words, our interconnected banking system can trade at leverage levels 10 times that of hedge funds. If you add to the mix interconnectedness, trillion dollar balance sheets, unmanageable complexity, and distorted incentive structures, financial instability is almost guaranteed. Again, we can talk more about this with the panel. I know there's been an avalanche of rules. Regulation is a growth business. But let us not confuse motion with movement. My third observation flows from the second. I believe that the days of instant market pricing and limitless securities market liquidity are fading. The great moderation conditioned many of us to underestimate credit risk. But it also bred a generation of traders, investors, bankers, and risk managers to presume an unfettered flow of capital and instant access to narrow bid offer spreads. And despite the experience of 2008 and 2010, many continue to assume that at the currently liquid end of the market, liquidity will be free and will be freely available. Short-term traders count on it. Algo trading depends on it. Long-short strategies presuppose that you can go short. Stop-loss disciplines demand that you're able to cover and cover quickly. But here's the thing. Confronted with sudden surges and cross-border flows, elected governments will attempt to intervene in the interests of stability generally and protecting the taxpayer specifically. They may not succeed, but it is their duty to try. Short selling bans in Europe, bond purchase penalties in Brazil, capital inflow barriers in Korea, outflow restrictions in Cyprus and India are merely a foretaste of the future. I recommend that you send your best and your brightest to the library, to the universities, to the financial history books, and research state intervention in the post-war period. Because like clean air and water, market liquidity is no longer limitless and no longer free. My fourth and final observation is that the unwinding of the extraordinary central bank policies is going to be a very volatile and rocky road. We all know that. We all feel that. But why? It's important to understand. Central banks worry about four things. They worry about inflation, the economy, financial stability, and political pressure, operating independence. Now think about it. Between 2008 and 2012, all four of these factors pushed in the same direction. They all pushed and pulled in the direction of liquidity injection and easy money. Inflation, that was not the concern. Deflation was on the front pages of every newspaper. Debates about economic growth, no. Depression was what was feared. Financial instability, panic was in the air. And as for the body politic, they were desperate for any and all measures, however unorthodox, in order to restore confidence and the possibility of economic recovery. That was then. 
But look at now. When was the last time you heard the word deflation? When was the last time you heard the word depression? The debate now is the speed with which inflationary expectations resume. The debate is how quick and how strong and how sustainable the economic recovery. The politicians haven't changed. If they face election, you can guarantee they want the central banks to keep the foot on the pedal. But central bankers within the central bank are no longer agreed at the outlook for inflation and the economy. They are aware, though they don't admit it, that the financial fabric of the banking industry is still weak and still vulnerable that the system is undercapitalized, that a rapid rise in rates could upset the entire system once again. So central banks will not agree within themselves what the policy should be. And even if they were to agree within themselves what the policy should be, they will not necessarily agree with their fellows in the fraternity of central banking. So the four factors that pushed in the same direction on the way in are pulling in different directions to different degrees on the way up and out. And this means it's going to be a very volatile get in, retreat, try, markets overreact, take fear, move back, change your mind, change your, out your outlook. And that's what we're going to have to deal with. Now, the only thing you can guarantee in such a scenario is that the central banks are likely to do too little, too late, instead of too much, too soon. But on that, you can bet. But in many ways, that's not the first time, is it? Indeed, if you consider all four points and observations, Instead of thinking that the future is not what it used to be, you could say that the future actually is exactly what it used to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert Jenkins. Uh, next up is uh, Roger Irwin. Good morning. Um, very real pleasure to be here, and um, my chance to just give you a few thoughts, one or two of them connecting with, with Bob's views there. Just a, a quick bio note, if I can start with it. Um, I spent the last two years working with just three clients, and the, the category that uh, I work on is called transformational change with asset owners, the, the, the big asset owners that are usually pension funds. I've, I've worked with first CalPERS in the US, secondly, the rail funds in the UK and third with a, a UAE sovereign wealth fund of size and stature, which declines to be named. Um, now, my comment about all of these situations is that they've come to me and to our firm to talk about complexity and a word Bob used, connections. Trying to understand fast-moving changes in the investment industry. and. Um, this is my uh, kind of way of, of picturing complexity and connections. And this, this picture is taken from uh, the, Queen, the UK Queen's Jubilee last year. Uh, the size of this picture is 100 metres by 75 metres. It was on the, the River Thames. It was, a, it was a centrepiece. And what you can see is, is the man kind of putting the picture up. And the analogy is, of course, how close um, he is to the Queen's forehead and how little he can see further out. And the key dimensions that he misses are these two dimensions of further out. First of all, to do with how many factors, mul multiple strands there are out there in a big picture. And secondly, looking much further out into the future. That's why I very much like to talk about um, in sessions where we talk about the word vision. This is really about 
being able to understand future trends. And, and I, I do stress, that's really what the big asset owners are trying to understand because they know the world is changing in a very big way. So just a, a couple of themes from this, and particularly dealing with complexity. Complexity is a factor of life. We have to welcome it. We have to make it our friend. We have to have a competitive advantage to do with it. And really, there's, there's two measures that deal with that. And the first is, is abstraction, which is basically about making things s simpler. Um, the Einstein quote is very apt. Make things as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that is the essence of many of our challenges in the investment industry. And also being prepared to adapt. And Darwin spoke not of survival of the fittest. He spoke of survival of the most adaptable. And how true that is in the investment industry. Now, the essence of what we do is captured by many different things here. But I just want to pull out one other word on this list, which is culture. And um, I've spent a lifetime working with asset managers trying to assess their capabilities into the future, into that long-term future. And I come back to pretty much an empirical fact, which is that the single most important factor differentiating the future performance of asset managers is the quality of their culture. It's the most enduring, it has the most relevant over multiple periods of time. And it's a people business we all inhabit, why wouldn't it be the most important factor of what we do and how we do things and the way we do things around here, uh, that general um, definition of culture. So let, let me just um, outline how these thoughts sort of come together in the investment world as we see it. Let's think a little bit about pressures uh, on us and represent what I see as, as uh, the analogy here for how I feel about the investment industry, which is the Red Queen race. Everyone is running as fast as possible to stay still. In order to get anywhere, you need to run faster than that. And the essence of that, I feel absolutely in terms of every year, it seems that way. And every, every December the 31st, you kind of declare victory, but you know that the next day is a more challenging year still. And Bob has referred to one of the reasons for that, which is to do with low returns. But I cite really how competitive our field has become. And it's competition for returns, absolutely. But it's also competition for talent. So uh, um, we've, we've talked about new normal very briefly. Um, investing in the new world order, which is, of course, really about major changes taking place, of course, in relation to financial conditions, financial repressionary conditions. But essentially, this is all about a change in geopolitical field. It's all about changing demography. It's all about changing aspects of natural capital as well. So the other dimension to this is um, picking up how much the content of our work has changed, really largely because investment theory has moved on, investment practice has moved on. And as a result of both of those points, I'm seeing more change in terms of what people do at the moment than I've ever seen previously in my career. And this new set of ideas that's permeating the investment industry represents perhaps our biggest challenge. Understanding that many of the foundations of finance need to be kind of uh, put through some sort of, of, of re-evaluation and come out with a more effective system of finance. One of the points that Bob has raised as well. So it does lead me to some of the sort of medium term issues, slightly longer range issues here, where I cite many of the same concerns that, that Bob does in terms of, of our predisposition to the potential for crisis, which has come about because of interconnectedness and the tightness of coupling of our financial system. And issues really about our future in, in the investment industry, which actually hover around the word legitimacy, how legitimate we can be. And aspects to do with sustainability, and I, and I really do raise that word in a very broad sense because to me this is all about the intergenerational accumulation of wealth, management of risk and decumulation. Uh, and all of those require longer term thinking and yet we're pressurised by so many short term pressures. So it's dealing with those short term pressures but without 
compromising in respect of long-term principles. And I do uh, think very genuinely that we are in the early days of reconsidering the potential for resource constraints to be very significant in the next decade of various sorts. And obviously we can talk about carbon and we can talk about a number of assets that actually could be stranded or could represent externalities in that particular field. So to summarize that, I think, is to say that as, as you think about your strategies, it's critical, I think, to have a, a near-term plan and to think that these changes are actually right on us, they're fast, and really it's all about execution. Better the decent plan violently executed than the perfect plan that we don't get round to. Very important um, kind of principle there. But corresponding to the second bounce of the ball, and I'm, I'm thinking more like a sort of rugby ball, if you will, as in it's kind of much more unpredictable, we have the need for that adaptation over time. I'm often sort of asked to coach asset managers about strategy. I, I, I build it down to kind of four m major principles. Um, I think the first principle is, is so much really is concentrated around multi-asset capabilities versus specializations. It's really doing the best of whichever field you're in from that point of view. It's not, to me, obvious that uh, asset managers have to have capabilities in every field. Um, the key dimension of organizational strategy is surely about aggregating investment returns more suited to that multi-asset type cap capability or distribution capabilities. Again, it's specialization that really counts and organizations making up their mind as to where their unique comp competitive position lies. But third, I'm going to re repeat, culture. That's really where quality and differentiation and success has the biggest chance of success. And I'm going to repeat, abstraction and adaptation, critical aspects of uh, being successful in these fast-changing times. Now, I'm just uh, very quickly going to sort of change gear a little bit and put change a bit of my day job hat, put that away, and kind of speak a little bit more from the heart for the CFA Institute, and emphasize something that it, it appears to me and my fellow governors that has really been underestimated, which is that we turn up at our respective places of work and often don't necessarily recognize the key features of why our profession is so important and its meaningful aspects for every person on the planet. And really, it, it, it is about the investment chain, as I, I put it, how it links from savings to investments to capital formation through the economic growth pattern. Uh, these, are, these are statements of motherhood and apple pie, but we, we rarely sort of seem to go back to them well enough to understand that we need a stronger investment chain than the one we have at the moment. And markets can do that stronger job for effective capital formation, and investment institutions can be more effective in their uh, promotion and management of wealth, of, of management of risk, and ultimately of drawdown over, over generations. And really this seems to me to be the asset test of good contributions in our industry. We all work very hard on increased returns. I think most of us work very hard on increased returns. Okay, so that, that I take as obvious. Reduced risk goes with that. It's obviously um, a, a trade-off between the two, but reduced risk goes with that. Reduced costs and negative externalities, which are forms of costs into the future. And the last two are probably the ones we don't think of enough. Increased trust and lesser agency issues. Increased trust in our industry and lesser agency issues. Not things that come to mind so readily. But I'm going to argue that every individual in the finance industry might wish to look at that list and say, yes, I make a difference in relation to at least one of those points. And hopefully it's more than one. So this is about perhaps a system that could do a better job with many of those features. And again, that is something that actually passionately motivates me through being a governor of the CFA Institute. So just the, the, the closing slide is just to remind you that there is a very interesting um, CFA Institute project that's uh, in passage here. You, you actually see it quite a lot in relation to um, advertisements in The Economist. 
And it really is making a statement, first of all, of, look, not everything is perfect in the world of finance, and, and there's a broken spoke here. And it is actually a very costly broken spoke. And sometimes we kind of don't tell the story with enough energy and with, not, with, not, with enough passion. And the CFA is in the early stages, it, well, it's actually moving quite fast now, to describe what we call the financial ecosystem. Again, I'm going to go back to that word connections. The ecosystem describes the subtle connections by, what, by which there is something going to thrive in our world that actually serves the deeper purpose of finance. And so some solutions are searched for here, a blueprint for a new and sustainable financial ecosystem because our current system actually has elements that are not exactly sustainable in it. And I do call out here that it's very interesting to sort of be part of the CFA. Um, definitely on a passage here, whoops, that's not quite working. Um, it's kind of a little bit animated, but let's okay. settle it. Um, yeah, um, key, key dimensions of the CFA, kind of moving from a sort of troubled parent to um, a thought leader helping the industry with its thoughts and also adhering to enlightened self-interest principles, principles which are so important and really that is stronger trust, stronger respect and stronger integrity in our industry. Thank you for making it this far and I'm um, happy to sit down and I will look forward to the panel as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roger Irwin, and finally, Bea Wittmann. Good morning. It's really a pleasure to be here in uh, Lausanne, and I uh, agree with quite most of what my uh, two colleagues said, but that doesn't mean that we won't have an interesting discussion. Um, I started in this business in '85, and um, if you read the last five years, what is uh, being written and being said and being done or not being done, you could get easily depressed. Um, but I can say that I'm positively um, inspired like in 85. I think we live in a very exciting inflection point in our industry. And I think it was important to um, also um, say something to uh, the importance of the investment management industry, linking savings with productive investments, you know, and the whole value chain related to it, uh, and you can enlarge it to society and to basically everybody on the planet. But I think our industry has been pretty lousy at transporting that, uh, that value to society. So that's one thing. So let me now drop five uh, thoughts uh, on you, more related to the asset management industry than to capital markets. Because on capital markets, I have a pretty easy attitude. Um, I set up a company in, uh, in uh, spring '09 and took my cash and put it into equities. So uh, you can assume that I have a constructive view on us emerging out of the mayhem of 2007 and 8. And the only thing I'm really amazed is how negative um, people globally still are about this uh, emerging growth and investment opportunity here. Um, never forget that risk has two dimensions. Risk is incurring a loss, obviously, and everybody's frightened to do that, especially in the post weight world. But risk is also losing an opportunity. Yeah? But I think that general sentiment is still not there. In the US it has changed, I must say, the last six to nine months when you look at fund flows and how the financial system has been rehabilitated. If you look at Europe, you know, you have the Anglo-Saxon world dreaming of the breakdown of the Eurozone, that's one thing. And you have investors, of course, buying bonds um, relentlessly and until today and shying away from equities. So my uh, view is uh, firmly positive for the next two, three years. Now let's come to the thoughts. Five things. Asset management is a global business. That's the first thing. Um, and that's, that's, that sounds trivial, but it's not so trivial. Um, and I think if you look at the CFA Institute and what just the CFA Institute has done the last 20 years, for example, and if you look at the members and the national breakdown of the members, you can probably just very, very clearly and strongly see how this thing has been globalized. And so I think 
uh, your institute has been clearly at the forefront of globalization, but I think the real world is um, lagging behind a bit. Then the second point is if you want to be sustainably successful in asset management, uh, then you have to focus on what you do. Yeah? Um, and that means um, care about where client needs are and where capital market opportunities are. Don't care so much what your competitors do because um, that's not very helpful, um, I think. And then it's also interesting to note that if you look at the top 30 asset managers in the world in size and in sustainable success, 80% of them are independent groups, typically partnerships. Sometimes, like in the US, they are listed. 20% of them are parts of banks. That doesn't mean that you cannot be successful running an asset management business within a bank or within a financial conglomerate, having said that. But you know, it's very important that you, know, you have a separate culture, separate strategy, and you know, that it's not linked to any kind of retail banking uh, uh, and investment banking uh, activities for that matter, because the culture is not transactional, but is really a fiduciary culture, yeah? assuming fiduciary responsibility for clients and delivering returns and managing risks. So that's an entirely different culture. Then the, um, the third point is, I indeed think that especially in Switzerland and in Europe, we have an absolutely unique and historic opportunity to build successful asset management businesses. Why? For two reasons. First, we have in a post-08 environment still anemic economic growth. We are barely exiting now recession territory, so people have completely other things on their mind. Then you have the banking system deleveraging still in Europe. Yeah, it's being rehabilitated. System security yeah, is, 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 is here now. Um, but you know, there's a lot of change in business models and strategy, refocus, recapitalization, etc. So that means that typically banks will tend to be um, uh, providers of, um, of, 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 of business opportunities in the asset management space. Um, then furthermore, you have of course also individual boutiques, but for individual boutiques, especially in a European context, uh, that's rather the exception to the rule, unlike in the Anglo-Saxon world, because it's not treated as a separate discipline. The regulatory requirements yeah, have gone up massively even in the last two, three years, you know, contrary to what politicians are, are telling uh, people. And therefore, um, investor defensiveness also has not helped because investors wanted security basically and safe counterparties and were not so worried about returns. And until a few months ago, they got yield uh, strategies in place and now that's a big question mark moving forward here. But there's a unique opportunity. You look at valuations um, of financials in, in Europe. They are trading historically in their lowest quintile prices as well. Sentiment is terrible, of course, and uh, regulatory changes are um, forcing uh, financial institutions to change their business models. Number four point, asset management is a business and therefore has also to be run as a business. You, you know, the greatest investment idea, the most intelligent engineering skill doesn't make a successful uh, asset management business. You, know? you have three dimensions. One is content, that's clearly key. Uh, you need to differentiate by results, by managing risks, etc., from your competitors. The second is, is clients. Uh, be close, be interactive, you know, and of course the traditional European business model of captive sales channels was really not uh, fostering a lot of innovation or risk taking uh, for that matter. And the third thing is something which is the most boring thing for uh, bank management or asset management. Business management is of course corporate services and corporate management, but it is absolutely mission critical. And you know, you talk about uh, finance, risk management, IT, regulation, compliance and all these things you know, there is absolutely you know no room for tolerance you know to be sloppy in these matters and I think uh, many players in our industry are learning this the very hard way for the first time in their lives but why not turn something which you can plan and execute corporate infrastructure into a competitive advantage 
has at large not been done in this industry. So run it as a business. And then last point, it was said before, and very rightly so, in asset management, the most differentiating factor is people. Um, and the aggregation of people, of course, is the corporate culture. And you want to have you know, medium, long-term corporate culture. For that, you need typically stable processes, setups, ownership structures, and strategies. That has also been rather the exception to the rule in the financial industry um, globally. But I think that's the most differentiating factor. But that doesn't mean that there is you know, the very idiosyncratic investment team there doing great things, uh, not caring about anything else. You know, We have seen booms and busts with this business model. It doesn't mean that you cannot have institutionalized processes you know, and proper functioning infrastructure. But you know, sustainable and superior corporate culture is absolutely um, um, a key to success long term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bert Wittmann. Uh, listening to all three of the gentlemen, uh, it is clear that uh, we are going through a transformational process. We've heard um, keywords such as inflection points. Um, I'd like to start with Roger. You have an inside look into asset owners. You, in your daily uh, uh, work, you speak with institutional uh, investors, pension funds, and so on. Talking to them, do you see that they have uh, adjusted well into this new environment already, or are they still stuck in the, say, pre-2008 great moderation environment? I think the answer is, is, is a mixture, Mark. Well, um, I, think, I think that one of the key dimensions to this is that they were quite taken by surprise in the global financial crisis. There was uh, rabbits in the headlights type of, of, of reactions to the global financial crisis. And since then, there's been a lot of thinking that has taken place. And one of the interesting uh, dimensions of this is about what I call the war for talent, which is that many of these asset owners were uh, overly reliant on their external asset management relationships. They continue to be important, but they have been able to put more resources into their organizations. And many of the, the, the big asset owners have quite large teams now working with external firms, but doing many things for themselves more directly. And where they have those internal teams, I, I think they found the thought processes uh, more easy to, to, to achieve. And I see uh, some of them really now uh, getting confident that they know more of what will drive the markets into the future, and they're, uh, they're more confident uh, exercising um, their powers um, relative to the way that they were in the past. One of the ways I look at this is that, um, let's say, the decade of the, of the uh, 2000s, um, the, the very dominant firms were asset management firms. It's, it's what I call sort of uh, financial capitalism. But uh, what's quite interesting now is there are many more discussions taking place about the leading um, investment professionals, professionals at Cowper's, at, uh, at uh, PGGM, at other big asset owners like that across the world. And um, these individuals are fiduciary capitalists, and they are, I think, having a quite a significant impact on, on what's taking place. Now, uh, having seen this, this, this eye-opening chart from, from, from Robert, um, which really showed that it's not today's environment that might be abnormal. It, it might really have been the, the 30 years prior to that that might have been abnormal. If I generalize it in, in, in broad terms, We've had a 30-year bond bull market and a generally quite benign environment of uh, uh, lower interest rates and good, uh, good tailwinds in equity markets. Um, now, in the, in, in the longer perspective, that might have been uh, abnormal. Robert, you told us that there was a, a big leverage bubble. You told us there was greed, stupidity, and excessive leverage in the system. What parts did central banks play, and what parts are central banks playing today in maybe 
blowing bubbles again. Well, I think you're asking our central banks uh, the problem or the solution. And I think that uh, no central banker would deny that they uh, were too late in taking away the punch bowl uh, from the party in 2006. The question is, have they learned the lesson for 2013? In the UK at the moment, and to some extent in the United States, there's of course a big debate about forward guidance. I've all heard the term forward guidance. And forward guidance was advertised uh, by the politicians, not by the central bankers, but by the politicians as promising clarity and certainty for businesses and reassurance about the future. Central banks don't think of it in terms of insurance and certainty. They think of it in terms of offering a greater degree of clarity as to the turning points that they will be looking at to change policy. But the marketplace is taking it, and the business managers are taking it, as an advertisement of certainty. And I think the conundrum and the reason for all of the confusion right now is that you cannot have certainty and still maintain credibility as a central banker. You cannot possibly tell people that interest rates are going to remain at low levels for two years and be credible in terms of your inflation fighting price stability uh, role. You can say, we think that rates will remain lower for two years. But if inflation rears its head or the economy recovers faster than we expect, we will raise rates. But then that doesn't give the certainty that the market expects. So you can have clarity, but not certainty. You can have certainty, but not credibility. The market wants all three. The market cannot have all three. Uh, and the result is a lot of confusion. And the only other thing I would add is that clearly, the fears over continued instability, the fears over uh, an economic relapse, uh, is keeping interest rates far lower, far longer than they would have been at this stage. I mean, when my son in New York can borrow 30-year money for a mortgage at a rate lower than the US government was able to borrow for 30 years only three years ago, something is seriously wrong. My son's a good risk, but he's not that good. <laughs> now, listening to both Robert and Roger, who have said that we will be looking at uh, periods of higher volatility. Uh, Robert, you said the financial system is still very fragile. Uh, we're looking at turbulent times ahead. Now, Beat, you gave a very optimistic uh, view in terms of markets. You said for over the next two, two to three years, you're, you're, you're very confident. Does that contrast to your two previous speakers? No, the analysis is uh, is pretty simple, but um, and similar, um, but um, uh, the conclusion is different. Um, if we would not have had the central banks intervening um, in '09, you know, we would have a real problem. Um, the question is only how far do you go, and um, and how do you get out of this. Um, of this money printing exercise and this um, ultra low interest rate policy and you know the future nobody knows but there are two three um, ways how we get out of it the easiest and le least painful one is that we simply grow out of it we kick start the motor in the US which has happened and we just gradually grow back to uh, potential <coughs> output and you know for you know, as a consequence, we get the same now in Europe, and it goes pretty much a long textbook. Um, and then you have the emerging markets, which have structurally higher growth, but of course, cyclically, you have bumps in the road. So that's the best. That's the best case. You just grow out of it. Um, you know what I'm. What I'm amazed at is that that investors have bought bonds since '09. 
all the time through until three months ago. And you know, how can you buy this type of bonds, G7 government bonds, if you see where the inflation rates are and where the growth rates are, and you have a 5, 10, 15 year uh, perspective? Um, that's, that's, that's the conundrum for me. And they shy away from so-called volatility risk in, uh, in, in equities. And that's just, just a dominating uh, sentiment still. So I had never a doubt that central banks print, it, when they say, they just, you can read the Fed minutes, they tell us, no, since years now, we print and keep rates so low until we get, you know, our growth target, our employment target, with, and then respecting, of course, a certain inflationary environment. And they just do that. And the ECB, you know, did that too from the very beginning. The only, the only uh, moment then it started to kick in was last summer when Draghi basically said was was clear anyway. But you could read in the FT every day, I mean not every month, not every week, every day and on the website probably every hour the demise of the Eurozone. A complete grotesque notion. Uh, and um, so people are so frightened about, about this monetary printing um, you know that they have basically not not invested, and you know I don't see I don't see a problem when I look at the sentiment and the capital flows at this stage. Now the key challenge is very clearly, and that is what the BIS, you know, the club of the central bankers, you know, wants to to achieve, is that the national politicians take up from their money printing exercise and engage in structural reform. And there I'm deeply skeptic, of course. But just in Spain last week, and I go every three months, and I think now it's interesting for the first time really to invest again. And it's the kind of smart money which moves into the market, the family office and some uh, US private equity groups, they start now to buy bank loans, but not the large, you know, uh, organizations. But you know, now, now, now it starts. Uh, but um, it's, it's the system integrity is, is secured. But you know the politicians, of course, as soon as things get a bit better, they will immediately stop you know labor market reform and this and this and that because they want to be reelected. So the risk for me is not so much the central banks. The risk for me is the national politicians, which don't take it up really um, where they should, and that would force the central banks to go longer than you know what is good for everybody into these exercises, and then then I'm then I'm also negative. But you know at the end of the day, I'm an investor. No? If you have the opportunity to have an expected return of 30 to 50 percent um, in European banks, for example, which still trade in their lowest quintile historically, <coughs> you know, I cannot, you know, I cannot afford to miss that out. So you share the diagnosis of the fragile yeah. financial system, sure. but you see a very sure. strong put by the central banks yeah. uh, that they've yeah. placed in financial markets. Well, there are two dimensions. One is first, they can buy whatever they like. No, I respect that. People b vastly uh, underestimate what central banks can do. They are not even close to their capacity. No, that, that's my view. And, uh, but you know, in, the, in the end, growth has to kick in and the system has to heal. And, and the central banks, you know, Bill White was writing a great paper two years before the crisis broke out. He was the chief economist of the BIS. And he wrote a great paper again a year ago about the unintended uh, consequences of, of, of expensive monetary policy. They're all right. They see it with their, with their eyes open. But of course, they're central banks. They're not national, national and elected politicians. Now, seeing that and seeing how important policy of central banks is to keep, to keep the system together, Roger, when you talk to investors, what prevents us from falling back into the old habits again of just assuming everything is fine, assume liquidity is there and everything, and fall into the next trap? Well, I think there are very strong uh, behavioral pressures on, on organizations to um, club together. And um, I think that uh, Biat there was, in a sense, referring to uh, the pressure on organizations to continue to invest in bonds uh, at uh, prices that uh, don't seem uh, particularly rational at times. Um, I, I do think that funds are confronting more uncertainty than they've had before, uncertainty being different from risk, and therefore I would argue quite, quite strongly that what funds are confronting is, is a measure 
of not really knowing whether or not these, uh, the, these, these central bank interventions are kind of drawing on future growth. It's, I think it's an intergenerational question that funds are looking at. And, and their response to it through their asset allocation has been, to me, you know, relatively indecisive so far, that they've found the uncertainty too difficult because politics is such a big part of asset allocation, more so than has been in previous generations. And we kind of have a sort of bimodal way of seeing the future at the moment. We kind of actually can see a number of uh, bumpy paths to recovery, but we could also see some, some uh, quite uh, adverse scenarios. It's difficult to invest for both. So I am kind of describing um, asset allocation at uh, the crossroads and people are having difficulty with it. Can I um, just uh, add a couple of points. So, first of all, I think there's another dimension to the global institutional uh, asset owners. Um, Roger uh, remarks related to advising some of the world's most sophisticated, uh, largest, deep-pocketed, cutting-edge uh, asset owners. Um, but out of the $72 trillion of assets under management, estimated globally, a very large percentage of it and doesn't operate with that level of sophistication. And in the United States today, uh, in Europe uh, today, there are still a lot of defined benefit programs that presuppose uh, and price their liabilities based on an 8% return or a 7% return. So I think we should keep that in mind. Um, in terms of uh, your other question, Mark, you asked me uh, were central banks in danger of creating another bubble? And Bayot was essentially saying that central banks can do whatever they want, and it's his job as an asset manager uh, to understand that and I think take advantage of that as best we can. Uh, the reason I'm a little bit less comfortable about it than, uh, than Bayot is because uh, of this interplay between inflation expectations uh, and interest rates and central bank policy. Uh, Central banks uh, are pretending uh, that there is not an inflation uh, problem um, because they are measuring uh, inflation in terms of consumer price index. But if you were to add in any shape or form asset price inflation to the inflation calculation, uh, you would have a different view of whether we've already exceeded uh, inflation uh, expectations and whether we're already giving the game away. And a small rise in interest rates uh, in percentage terms uh, can create a different dynamic uh, in the equity markets and a different dynamic in the financial system. Uh, Abenomics is targeting 2% uh, um, uh, inflation. If Japanese interest rates were to align with 2%, a 2% rise, a rise to 2% of Japanese interest rates in Japan would wipe out the entire equity basis of the Japanese banking system. They would be bankrupt. If you mark to market the Japanese holdings and government securities to 2% interest rates, they're gone. A back in the envelope calculation says that a return to, say, a 5% yield level in the United States uh, would produce losses uh, on the U.S. banking system's balance sheets just on its government securities holdings and government-backed uh, securities holdings of 35 to 45 percent of their capital base. So we are, everything hinges on a belief that inflation expectations remain manageable. And that in turn is gearing off a measure of inflation which doesn't include the asset price inflation which is going on as we speak. So uh, I'm a little bit more cautious uh, the day. It doesn't mean that volatility doesn't produce opportunities. On the contrary, uh, it will produce more opportunities. But it does mean that a lot of basic assumptions under which institutions are running their money and private uh, wealth managers are running their money uh, may not be uh, appropriate. Now you, raise an, you raise an important point, uh, Robert the average pension fund probably doesn't have the sophistication level of a CalPERS. Uh, also, when I look here in Switzerland, the average pension fund still is heavily, heavily invested in bonds, in fixed income uh, paper. And they still do that. 
Do we need a radical <laughs> rethinking in asset allocations there? Roger, would you? Well, I think that the, the way to see it, uh, most pension funds is through the, the sort of dual goals of security and affordability. So essentially, when you think about both of those goals, because funds have to be um, competitive in their returns to, to, to afford the benefits that actually uh, are, are, are defined, are promised. And uh, Bob referred to uh, a number of funds across the world that have that old 7 or 8% discount rate. That is premised on the idea that pension funds have to be affordable. And security kind of, for them, might come second. That's an interesting dimension. But security advances bonds that essentially um, a typical defined benefit promise in terms of, of what's being paid to a pensioner is all about um, a bond-like liability. So it's not a surprise to me to find the global averages. But this is both the sophisticated funds and, and the less sophisticated funds has roughly gone in a direction towards about 40% in, in bonds. Um, that figure has, has kind of largely stayed up there. The interesting one is that um, the exposure to equities has come down because people have been finding their way into other types of investment, often referred to as alternatives. Now, uh, the, the Swiss pension funds have always had their exposure to real estate. They've always had, I think, a certain amount of diversification that's actually held them in reasonable stead. So uh, I think that the, it's all about each fund working out the balance of, of risk and reward they can afford, given the need to secure assets. I think that's a very tricky balancing act. And actually, for what it's worth, I, I, I get rather nervous about funds taking on too much risk. And again, back to the ones that, that Bob was, was referring to. US uh, public funds in particular are, are the kind of uh, the pinup for funds that need that 7 or 8%, aren't likely to get it. And in the kicking the can down the road that is happening with funding those state plans in the US, you do see a slow motion train wreck at some stage in the future. Yeah, do you get worried when you look at the typical Swiss pension funds asset allocation today? Well, it's a pretty heterogeneous universe. Um, and I don't think that, that investment decisions are just being taken as a function of the sophistication or the cleverness of investors. I mean, uh, it depends also uh, how, about the corporate setup, how, how the people who are taking decisions are incentivized. Whether they are incentivized to manage their career risk, um, or they are economically incentivized, whether they are sitting in large organizations or they are sitting in a, in a large hedge fund, um, very different behavior. I mean, you can assume they are equally clever, equally sophisticated, equally educated. It doesn't mean that the investment decision is the same. So there are a multitude of factors. Uh, Swiss pension funds. Um, Generally speaking, what is positive to be said, they have a pretty global scope always by just you know, the small size of the country and the outward looking nature of it. So they had always a pretty high equity quota, typically speaking. So regulation, I always say that uh, uh, regulation in Switzerland was never a, a good excuse for bad performance. Regulation allows you basically to perform for an average pension fund in Switzerland. Now, when you go to special brackets like uh, insurance companies, you know, where you have special regulation, there's a lot of forced investment into fixed income. And fixed income markets are the largest markets in the world, way larger than equity markets. And there's a lot of, you can call it financial repression, um, uh, 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 regulation to ensure that fixed income is being bought. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't want to see how bond portfolios will do in a rising uh, and, and interest rate environment which you have just described, uh, how, how JGBs would look like when uh, Japanese interest rates go there. You know, in equities at least you can take a decision in five minutes to get out in fixed income. We know you can forget about that. There's totally liquidity. So I think Swiss pension fund for that matter are um, from the regulatory, regulatory regime pretty flexible to, to achieve their goals. And most of them, I think, have done a, a pretty good job at doing that. I fear more for the repressed regulation in certain corners of the market where they are not allowed to go into uh, multi-asset class strategies and are stuck in fixed income. I'd like to open for questions. There's a microphone in the room, and there's a question.
question in the back. I'll bridge the, the gap. Robert, you teach finance. Um, did you have to, did you have to uh, change basic tenets of finance, i.e., is there still such, thing, such a thing as a risk-free uh, interest rate? Or do you, did, did you have to change basic tenets there? <laughs> that's, a, that's a topic in and of itself. And in fact, in January, uh, the BIS held a very interesting colloquium on uh, whether or not uh, we were at the end of risk, a world without a risk-free rate of return, and what would it look like. Um, and just to cut to the conclusion, I mean, uh, you know, the risk-free rate of return underpins $20 trillion of pension liability calculations, um, all sovereign wealth fund uh, portfolio asset allocation uh, optimization assumptions, $600 trillion of derivative uh, calculations, first and foremost swaps, which all come back to a U.S. Treasury or yield over U.S. Treasury. So you can imagine uh, if that uh, begins to be doubted seriously, we are in a financial world without a center of gravity. Hmm. Question in the back. Back to the important topic of transparency. Um, we are an unprecedented level of regulations in the UK with the new retail distribution rules uh, in Switzerland where the federal court decided against any hidden fees in discussion of portfolio management unless the client agrees. It's a growth industry regulation. <laughs> it is indeed. Um, and given the fact that when you buy a car or even a bottle of milk, you don't ask for who makes what kind of money, um, I'm wondering whether first it is sustainable on the long term, whether there are really opportunities out of it, and whether this is not the end of the open architecture. The end of which sector? Open architecture. Open architecture. Open architecture. Open architecture. Yeah. Who would like to have a go? Well, the prediction of the end of the open architecture uh, has been around for a while. Um, no, I would say that uh, I trust that Roger's remarks are that um, you either you either aggregate the returns or you are in the distribution business, and um, open architecture seems to me it would be more important in the future, not less important. Well, I would add uh, that open ar architecture has, has, has got a value proposition to it. So I'm not um, of the view that um, I, I agree with Bob that I see it as a, as a more important component. I mean, I, underneath, um, I'm not sympathetic to the idea that um, costs cost matter. I mean, it's a huge challenge for uh, investors and ultimate beneficiaries of investment products to, 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 to have uh, a net return that, it, that is sustainable over time. And so co the cost uh, transparency seems to me to be, um, it's, it's a special industry. It's a very important um, component of our work in finance that uh, we carry responsibility and our investors don't always recognize all the components of what goes into a return. So on that basis, I think transparency has gone in the right direction. Um, but we have to adapt. I think, again, it's a very critical component that um, our, our previous practices led, I think, to some, um, some degree of, of easier money than, than was legitimate. And so from that point of view, I think we're now in a, in a better industry given those, those points of transparency. Dale, do you have anything to add to the, the issue of hidden fees? No, I, the pendulum of regulation will, for years to come, uh, swing into the same direction. More of it, I simply take it as a given, and I think you can operate, build, and grow an asset management business in pretty much any country. You know, you just respect what the regulation is and you cope with it. So that's my attitude. Uh, and open architecture, short term, I think open architecture is under pressure. Because, of course, the big distribution channels are finding very innovative ways all the time to, uh, to, uh, to protect their uh, clients, you know, in captive uh, channels to protect their bottom line. But, you know, uh, beyond that, very clearly, there is this future for open architecture and for transparency and for uh, clients choosing whatever they want. So, but that's a long-term trend. Are there other questions?
maybe a better answer or a slightly more complete answer would be from the point of view of the investor, open architecture has a great future. From the point of view of a bank, yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. it will find competition with the platforms. Mm. In my mind, a platform mm. is part of open architecture, yeah. but from a bank's point of view, it's a threat. Mm. Mm. We have gone uh, from the invisible hand operating in the market uh, to the very visible hand of central bankers and financial professionals seem to be devoting a lot, if not most of their time, to second guessing what central bankers are going to do. Isn't there a lot of moral hazard in this uh, state of affairs. When I see there was also a paper that you no doubt know uh, that uh, you know the Fed might face a lot of, uh, in fact, losses on its bond holdings, the bond they bought, uh, were interest rate to increase too fast, and that kind of asked whether you get into a situation that's close to a conflict of interest. Well, uh, actually, the remark was not that the Fed's balance sheet uh, would suffer, although it would. I don't think there is the a Fed, paper in this regard as well. Uh, it's, a, it's the banking system's balance sheet yes. uh, which would suffer. And uh, yes, that is moral hazard. That uh, We've gotten ourselves into a situation where we can't take away uh, the remedy without uh, putting the patient back in the hospital. And that's why I believe that uh, uh, although there will be a genuine, determined, and honest effort by central bankers to do what's right, they will constantly uh, step back uh, from, uh, from uh, reversing the policies as they should because of the uh, consequences to a banking system that remains uh, highly vulnerable. Can, can, can I take this opportunity? You would all be very helpful to me if you could, uh, if I could do a, a, a two-question survey just by a show of hands. Uh, there, J.P. Morgan has been in the news a lot lately. We've all followed J.P. Morgan. Um, how many in the room think that J.P. Morgan is too big to manage? How many think that it's not too big to manage? Those of you who think that it's not too big to manage, do you think that the current management is up to the job? <laughs> Thank you. We have time vote for one further question. Okay. Gentlemen, uh, got a, you've spoken of a very difficult time the last five years, crisis mode, basically. You've spoken governments have attempted to address it with more regulation. And banks, as a managers, try to address it any way they could, adapt, ad, adapting to it, uh, telling their people to get better education, improve their, their skills. Some banks are forcing their people to take courses. And yet, most of the clients I've spoken to the last five years, they didn't speak about that was the reason why they distrust the industry. I, I, I meet a lot of people who think people in the financial industry are people that we can no longer trust the way we, we, we used to. Um, what would you say we could do to restore trust in the industry? Roger. Um, certainly the, um, the, the challenge is, 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 he is heavy on us. Um, I mean, by the way, I, I do think we just got to recognise that the pendulum, um, which was very uh, much for a sort of market fundamentalism, invisible hand, um, proved to be badly positioned. I don't think there's any doubt that that um, that the industry cannot be, uh, in aggregate, be trusted with all dimensions of, of this challenge. So I think we have to start off with that realistic position in our minds. And regulation is, is, to me, a price worth paying, although effective regulation, unfortunately, is this oxymoron. We, we can't get effective regulation. Um, so trust, I think it's a wow of a question, because I, I would love to find um, pieces of the uh, 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 
between us, Bob and I actually have a little leaflet here, which we, which I was going to give a little plug to, and, and maybe maybe we both might uh, add our weight to it. The um, d dimension of this uh, challenge, to me, is is captured by individuals joining our industry who are principled and who have a real sense of purpose, purpose to the benefit of society. And so from that point of view, I think it actually goes back to every one of us to work hard within a principled environment. And our organisations carry culture to do that, and we as educated professionals have the chance to do that as well. Uh, the Statement of Investor Rights is, is, is a CFA um, in, initiative which is very, very important for um, individuals and organisations to just do the right thing by the people that they, uh, they do their work for. Do the right thing. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very neat bit of work that is, I think, um, contributing from the CFA Institute's uh, a thought leadership to, to do something positive for it, developing this trust. Um, I, I tracked the statistics on um, the, the trust that people have for different parts of the f finance industry, for the banking industry. It it's, is still at a low point. It has rebuilt a little bit, but it is still at a low point. And I do think that therefore represents the idea that all, the, all too often we are seeing uh, organisations, and we've, we've had a, a simple example here um, being discussed, uh, I think, in terms of JP Morgan. Um, I do think that we, we have examples of organisations that you know, can let down the industry at times because uh, um, they, they don't necessarily find it easy to ma maintain um, sustainable practice. I think, I think it comes mm -hmm. back to sustainable practice. Bayard and Robert, do you have anything to add how the industry can regain trust? In the My market? only point about this, if you, uh, I really encourage you to take a look at this. This is, um, if you read, uh, it, you know, it's only 10 points. And if you read it, your first reaction will be, well, you know, very simple, very straightforward, uh, almost naive. You know. Basically, it says investors should come first, customers okay. should come first. Uh, but, uh, and we recognize that financial services organizations serve multiple stakeholder groups, so executives, employees, the community, the customer, uh, more than one organization. The question is, where does the customer rank? And at least for the banking industry, uh, financial services more generally, the customer perceives that he is ranked very, very low. And this is an attempt to try and move the customer up the ranks. Now, I'm under no illusions that if you move the customer up the ranks, you create tension internally within your organization. All of you will be, find yourselves in a situation where you are torn between doing what your management thinks is right and proper in order to maximize profitability and what is right and proper in order to maximize the welfare of the client. And that's an extremely uncomfortable position to be in. The question you have to ask and your management has to ask is, can these two be reconciled? And the answer is they can be reconciled provided the time horizon for the measurement of success and profitability is long. If it's short, if it's next quarter, next year, next two years, next three years for the deferred bonus uh, maturity, it's almost impossible to put the customer near the top of the list. If you are talking, as Bayad presumably is doing with his own business, if you are building a business over time, if you are the owner of the business, if you are a partner in the business, if you are willing to get rich slowly as opposed to get rich quickly, then putting the customer uh, at the top might actually be good for the st all other stakeholder groups. So I think the issue really is the time horizon within which the investment management profession builds and measures its success. And will we move that time horizon out? I don't know the answer, but I, I know what the challenge is. Bayon, the final word is yours. I very much agree with this, and it's not naive at all. That's the right way to go. That's fiduciary uh, duty. 
Uh, there's an interesting Lex column today in the FT about uh, that staff still comes before clients in banks and the pretty cynical out outlook about it, so I share that too. And I would start the whole thing regaining trust by breaking up the universal banking system. Um, pretty simple. That's the only thing which makes sense. <laughs> okay. That's a powerful last word. <laughs> With that, please join me in a round of uh, applause for the panelists. Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for the very interesting and, and very thought-provoking remarks. I, I certainly enjoyed listening to your comments, and I'm sure our audience as well. Um, in, in order for us to um, host such an event, um, to have such, such a good turnout, uh, obviously uh, we needed um, some uh, preparation, some administrative support. Um, we would like to uh, thank um, certainly um, our, our partners, Montcantin uh, and for for their excellent um, support in helping us to organize this event. Um, as, as our corporate sponsor, um, they, they clearly took this endeavor very seriously, and uh, as, as you can see, the, the results have been <coughs> magnificent, so we, we thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there, there are um, two individuals um, we, we would like to thank in particular. Uh, who were instrumental in, in making this uh, truly a success. Um, there is um, um, Madame Maria Belen Maté, who was involved in the administration. She worked very closely uh, with our office in the soup, with, with our, our staff. Uh, she put in a lot of hours and a lot of preparation, um, particularly in, in terms of uh, making arrangements with the hotel, the catering, and uh, we would like to uh, recognize her tremendous um, efforts. So, Madam Mate, thank you very much. <laughs> and um, as, as a um, token of our thanks, we, we have something that we would like to present to you. So, if, um, if you could stand up. And uh, the other person uh, that we would like to thank is this gentleman who, who just stood up, um, <laughs> Tristan um, Takushi. We, we offer him um, a, a token of our appreciation. This is not just for him, but also for his team of volunteers who, uh, who have worked very hard um, in supporting um, both him and the uh, society in planning this event. So, that, um, Christian, this is something that you can share with your, your fellow volunteers. Thank you very much, Christian. And, and so, um, I would like to now hand it to Mr. Bixel, who will make the final remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having thanked the right people. They were also on my list, so I think that's exactly right. I think without the initiative of Christian Takushi, and his determination to make it happen in Lausanne, you would not have done it. And uh, my assistant, Mme uh, Mate, obviously made it happen in a practical way. I think that's uh, good uh, to mention that. Uh, before we close, let me just uh, raise an item which I found important uh, during these presentations, and which also I mean, comfort us in the cooperation with the CFA uh, Society. Um, what came out on many instances was the fact that one has, of course, to master the technicalities and the knowledge of our business. That's clear. That's the fundamental uh, the basis of everything. But also that that is not enough. I think it has to be accompanied by healthy ethics, the proper culture, which goes along, and also the notion of adaptability. I think there's nothing worse than certainty. I think it's good to have convictions. Certainties are usually dangerous, so I think one has to be adaptable. If one has, if, if things develop, one evolve, one has to be able to adapt to a new situation. I think these are key values, and they only combine it make a success in the long run for our clients.
question I think we all have to ask ourselves in the asset management on a regular basis, and that has been raised by some of the panelists also, do I make a difference for my client? I think that's the reason of being. Do I make a difference for my client? Do I keep my promise? And that keeping your promise is probably the good best way of starting restoring trust. I think that's if you talk about uh, broken trust, is also because clients feel let down because they have been promised a number of things and uh, the promises have not been met. I think just keeping the promise is probably a very practical way of, of, of uh, climbing up the ladder. And then to put it in a more crude way, I think we all have to ask ourselves, do I deserve to be paid? I think that's probably the, uh, the bottom line of the question. If we don't deserve to be paid, we probably shouldn't deserve to be in the business. I think that's uh, as simple as that. And I think if you keep that in mind, I think we will probably put our business forward in an ethical and, and uh, competent way which I think is uh, the, the good recipe for the future. So all these values combined uh, make uh, for us uh, to be convinced that the, the associated with the CFA Institute is a good thing. So I'm very happy about this kickoff meeting here in Lausanne. I think the turnout has been great. I'm looking forward to future events of the same kind, and I think we will be there uh, to help you if, if you want.